Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. In fact, I shall try to explain you uh, how I have lived neurosurgery because I started uh, my neurosurgery, I may say my neurosurgery, many, many years ago. So I think it's important to travel with you in the, the past, uh, in the present, and uh, I shall try in the future too. As always, uh, okay. So, what is neurosurgery? Neurosurgery is a surgery of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. And you see here, for the brain, it's uh, anatomical cut, the brain stem, and the spinal cord. Facts. We shall start by facts, of course. When I was uh, 25 years old in uh, 1977, 67, I decided to enter neurosurgery. At that time, when I was 25 years old, we had clinical sense, we had uh, x-rays, angiography, ventriculography, but were not existing, you have to know that CT scan was not existing, MRI, PET scan, microscope, and so on. At that time, we were not thinking that one day we could be able to see something in the head of patient, even to see the tumor in the brain. That was the situation at that time. So we had to do our neurosurgery based on X-ray, and for example, here you have calcification, and we put that in addition with angiography. Angiography means mass effect on some arteries, on some veins, and if needed, complete it with the ventriculography. That means the hole puncture of the ventricle and injection of a dye. And according to that, we were making a diagnosis, and uh, we were I would say, uh, uh, deciding to do trepanation and to remove uh, a tumor without any help of what you will see later in other slides. Now, I would say, 39 years ago in uh, 1982, I start 1982 because it is the time when I have opened in Erasmus Hospital, a new department, which was the Department of Neurosurgery. Nobody was waiting for me, no patient, nothing. But I was discussing, of course, with the direction, with the medical council, in order to have the best tools as possible to build a department, a modern one. So what we had, we had, of course, what I have said before, in uh, 1892, we had CT scan, MRI, PET scan, stereotype. But what is important to know that even in 1982, neuronavigation was not existing, gamma knife, magnetoencephalography, brain uh, stimulation, MRI in surgical theater, and even some uh, hope with cell grafting we were discussing about. So you will see that uh, things change progressively with the time. So this is a CT scan showing you a tumor which is a, a benign one, a meningioma. And of course, after injection of the dye, you see the tumor. No comparison with what I have shown in the beginning with X-rays, angiography, ventriculography. In addition, of course, we can have detail with MRI, but what is interesting, of course, is to have a very precise control after surgery, complete removal of the tumor, and no problem at the level of the brain. We have a precision that we had not before. That changed completely the future, not only of neurosurgery, but the future of patients, of course. The microscope modified completely 
the way we were operating due to two things. First, magnification, and second, illumination with a beam coming down. And we had, at the level we were operating, together magnification and illumination. And that let us, that give us, gave us the possibility to perform surgery in a much better way than in the past. And this is, for example, one of the microscopes I have used during my activity in Erasmus Hospital. I shall come later on that. Of course, many things happen, but I want to focus on some special things which I would say have been a key point in my career and the career of the department. For example, PET scan guided by stereotaxy for brain tumor biopsy. Stereotaxy is of, uh, the way we are detecting and uh, we are modeling the in the three space uh, the, the lesion and of course biopsy is not new. But using combination with PET scan guided biopsy was completely new at that time. So what is important? Here you have an example of a brain tumor. This is the MRI. It's a, a glioma. And what we have discovered, by combination of the PET scan here, here you have a hot spot, a second one here. But the other part of the volume of the tumor doesn't take the isotope. So the engineer made a fusion of the images that what you have. And so we could make biopsy in the hotspot and biopsy beside. And we have seen that the diagnosis was not the same. If we do the biopsy here, we have a good prognosis. If we do the biopsy here, we see that we have a grade three mean anaplastic tumor. And of course, the treatment after surgery will be different or after biopsy. So by combination of both, it was a very big improvement. And due to that, we had the honor in, uh, uh, in the 90s, we had the cover of the review of neurosurgery and this is an example in uh, the cerebellum, but showing the same principle what I have explained you before in the brain, so I'm not repeat. So, today, in 2021, I would say, the challenge is of course to save life, but it's not enough. The challenge is to save quality of life. And we have the possibility today, not only to do a surgery as it was in the past and remove the tumor and say, okay, uh, the tumor is totally removed, but the patient is hemiplegic. It's not a success. So today, really, we have to preserve quality of life. And for that, we are a lot of possibilities that I want to explain you uh, how it is. So what do we have today? We have everything. And in addition, we have uh, endovascular therapy. I shall focus on that later in my talk. But we have also magnetoencephalography, gamma knife, navigation, and so on. And I shall explain you what happened. It means that every week, every month, every year, we have improvement. Our medicine is not stable. And we have to follow the improvement. And we have to, to stay and to battle to stay at the top level of the 
specialty, if we do a specialty, or at the top level of general medicine, if we do general medicine. But we need to be aware and to read what happens every month. You have the review, and of course it's important to, to read and to, 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 uh, to be at the top level of the new technologies and the possibility for the patient. So I show you again the image of the meningioma, which is a, a benign tumor, and I have a video to show you under the microscope how it's going on. This is a tumor. This is a brain. What is very difficult and important is to keep all those veins patent and no, co no coagulation, because here, is a motor strip. If we do a coagulation of this vein, the patient will awake hemiplegic. So the challenge of this surgery was to turn around the tumor and to detach all the adhesion of the veins to the tumor without any coagulation. But to do what you see here, it would be, have been impossible to do it without the help of the microscope. What you see here, it's uh, what we see uh, with the microscope, and I think that it's uh, really uh, good, uh, fantastic help uh, that we could not uh, perform before. So I shall show you this is the end of surgery, and of course, when the tumor is removed, you see the vein is patent and the patient awake, say hello doctor, moving the hands, moving the legs, and very happy, and the doctor too, of course, very happy, uh, seeing that the quality of life has been preserved, and that is very important today. Today we can also use the performance of the MRI. For example, functional MRI. Here we have a tumor. It's possible with functional MRI to, I would say, to light, to enlight part of the brain by asking the patient to make a movement or talking during the exam. And you have illumination of some zones, some area. This is the PET scan, and of course the engineers, they combine everything. After we put all the data in the computer, we work the day before in order to decide the limit of the tumor, and of course the limit of the motor strip that you we cannot touch. And of course during surgery, we have the possibility to do that, and that is uh, the first step to navigation that I shall explain you in a moment. And here, of course, you have the motor strip, which is saved again. So this is very important for quality of life. Today, of MRI has improved and is able to show you the track. This is tractography, so you can see sensory pathway, motor pathway, everything. And this is something which has been of great help. For example, we have a tumor here in the right occipital lobe. Here, in violet, you have, uh, in, uh, in this color, we have the optic tract, which are shifted. And due to that, by preparation of surgery before, the day before, by knowing where is the optic tract, we can remove the tumor and keep safe the optic tract so the patient has no hemianopsia when he is awaking. And you again, this is thanks to tractography, which is something which was not existing even in 82, that came later. Navigation is fantastic. Navigation is like a GPS in our car. It means that we prepare the surgery the day before, not only to go in one point, to go in one point, 
this is stereotaxy, which was used in the past, uh, even with ventriculography and so on, and today, as I have said, with CT scan, MRI, and PET scan. Navigation is to know exactly where you have to go right, then go straight, then go left, to arrive at the point you have to arrive when you have a tumor which is deep-seated in the brain, in order not to go straight, because if you go straight, you will cut a lot of fibers. So you need to know exactly how to navigate in the brain. That is the reason why we say navi neuro-navigation. And we can use that today. For that, we have special tools with markers here. And of course, a satellite in the operative theater. You will see the satellite in uh, two or three slides later. We prepare with uh, uh, a lot of points we do on the head in order to prepare the localization. And then we can do the navigation under the microscope. But you see today, in the operative theater here, it's one of my collaborators doing that surgery is alone. You don't see the nurse because she is here. But you see the lo a lot of computer screen and so on. So it's not the same as it, it was 20 years before. We are taking a lot of benefit of computerized surgery. And this is very important, again, for precision and quality of life. This is an example. Here we have a tumor again. We have a cyst. That part is malignant, should be taken off. We have delineated the limit of what we have to remove. And we put everything in the computer. And then when we do surgery, we know Thanks to navigation, where we are, otherwise we can be lost in the brain. It's also possible today to perform surgery in awake patient. Of course, the pa we ask the anesthetist uh, to do anes general anesthesia for the beginning, when you cut the, the skin, when you cut the bone, and when you open the dura, but since the brain is not sensible, no pain when you touch the brain, you can awake the patient. And for example, what I shall show you is a case given to me by Professor uh, Michael Bruno, who is now the chief of department of neurosurgery at UZVUB. And uh, he, did a, he was performing a surgery on an artist who was a pianist, a very important to keep all the fingers. You, so he did the surgery in a wake patient, and I shall show you. Of course, with navigation, so you see here special markers which are linked to the operative table, and here other markers with tools we shall use for surgery everything uh, for localization before and after with a satellite. This is a satellite in the operative theater. We point on the markers here on the table, then on the tools we shall use for surgery. And so everything is ready. Surgery is going with all the computers and so on, what I have said. And uh, we have here the tumor. We can have illumination of, so, uh, for example, the speech area or the motor area, for example, uh, of the hand that we have to preserve. This is post-op. But what is important that I want to show you is this. I don't know, maybe, yes. See, the patient is awake and he is moving the hand during surgery. So this is what we call 
awake neurosurgery. And the, and the patient, every time, Professor Bruno was asking, move your hand, move your hand. And the nurse here, she was talking to the patient and verifying that everything was okay. And understand that for a pianist, it's vital for the future, for him, for his profession. Something else is magnetoencephalography. It's the, a tool, special device, see here, which record magnetic field of the brain when the brain is in activity. Physician, not doctor, physics people, I would say specialize in physics and mathematics, they know that electric, any electrical source is producing a magnetic field. Our brain, when the brain is active, we have a neuron activity which can be recorded by EEG. Thanks to that machine, that tool, it's possible to record very low, very low magnetic field produced by neuron when they are in activity. This is very important today for surgery of epilepsy, to see exactly where is the focus. Why? Because it shows how the message is going on in the brain. So it's not only something which is lighting like the uh, MRI, as I have shown you. It's, you can follow how is the message is going in, in the brain. This is very important for the future, for research, for a lot of illness, especially in children. And uh, we use that machine too for some surgery, which need a very important precision. For example, we can see where is the right lip, the right median nerve. This is a tumor. But to see the lip, it's impossible today with an MRI. We need such a tool. So thanks to all those improvements, really neurosurgery today is not the same as neurosurgery was when I started in 67. I want to say a few words also on intraspinal cord tumors because that was a topic in which I have invested a lot during my career. When I was young and when we were doing surgery on a spinal cord, opening a spinal cord, the patient, even we, if we were able to remove the tumor, the patient was awaking with complete paraplegia or quadriplegia if the lesion was cervical. Today, it's different, and I shall show you a case I have operated, and you will see the video. This is a tumor, very high cervical, because this is C, C2, C3. This is the day after surgery, control, complete removal, but I want to show you how we can do. First of all, is to search for the midline to open the midline because when we know the anatomy, we know that the midline is fiber and we can separate the posterior columns again without bleeding, without coagulation. And here in dark is the tumor which is appearing. So we shall open the cyst here close to the tumor then we shall put some suture from the pia to the dua in order to keep the field open that we have been the first in the world to detail that technique and be able to work inside without any retractor on the spinal cord 
and having a large view of the tumor. And so we can progressively separate the tumor from the spinal cord. Coagulation of some feeders, arterial feeders, small ones that we can see under the microscope. But without microscope, we don't see such small vessels. We always take a piece in order to have the histology during surgery to confirm what we are thinking we are operating. Here it's an ependymoma. And uh, we are arriving in the depth at uh, we see the normal spinal cord. Why? To see the last vessel, the last feeder. And uh, this is a complete removal of uh, ependymoma at C2, C3 level. No bleeding. And then at the end, I close the spinal cord in order to repair the anatomy and to put uh, over the arachnoid also in order to, to put the patient as it was before the tumor came inside. Today it's possible to do that. What I show you was not possible even in the 80s. That was possible at the end of the 90s and of course beginning of this century. So today a question, is it possible to cure brain tumors without trepanation? I shall show you the brain, you have seen the spinal cord, you have seen, but is it possible to treat some tumors without opening the skull? And the answer is yes, with stereotactic radiosurgery and especially with the gamma knife, which I'll show you. It is a special tool which gives you an accuracy of 0.01 millimeter on the target. It's like a military tool. This is the tool. What is more interesting is to understand what it is, is for. Outside you have a source of cobalt, here a hamlet, and 140 windows. Through each window you have a ray coming, focusing in one point, and you bring in that point such a high field that you destroy the tumor. It is, I can compare that with what you do with magnification and the sun and a piece of paper. If you focus, it will burn. If you defocus, it will, you will, it will be warm, it will be heat, but it will not burn. The same principle here. So what is here will be destroyed. And this is important for quality of life. This is an example of a brain metastasis here. It is this small tumor just in the motor strip. We can remove it surgically, but the risk of a motor deficit is very high. So when the volume is small, because of course if I speak about focusing, it should be on small lesion. You cannot focus on a big volume. So on a small volume, we focus. And this is a situation one month after treatment, nine months, 27 months, and you see the brain is normal and you see no tumor. We can do the same with acoustic schwannoma and to preserve hearing and facial nerve. This is just before treatment with gamma knife after six months, after one year. So when we have small lesion, this is better than open surgery. Something else, the patient is entering the hospital the day before, he has a treatment, he is living the day after. It's impossible if you open the skull, 
minimum one night in the intensive care and three to four days, five days in the hospital. So you, it's, it's important even economically. For children? Yes, of course. No problem. No problem. No problem. It's a question because uh, radiation, good question. We don't like to irradiate brain or cerebellum in children because it's, uh, it gives problem for the development in the future. But here with the gamma knife, you have no irradiation on the way. Everything I I on each line you have seen, the level of radiation is very low. But where all the rays are crossing, it's very high. So all around the lesion, no irradiation, only the tumor. At the condition, of course, it's a small one. It can be used in children the same as in adult, at the condition, the volume is a small one. So, something, some words about stroke, because stroke is very important, is the co first cause of disability of patients less than 65 years. We had uh, not far than 30,000 cases every year in Belgium. It can be hemorrhage. 20% or ischemic. The main cause of hemorrhage is an aneurysm. An aneurysm is a dilatation where arteries are crossing. And of course, at the top, it's always very fragile and it can be an explosion and a massive bleeding in the brain. So. During years and years, we were operating. Even putting a tie with uh, like a suture at the level of the neck. Later came clips, like clamp, like that. Under the microscope, it was very different. Under the microscope, we were putting such a clip in order to to avoid any possibility of bleeding of the aneurysm, and of course, not to put in the clip any vessel, of course. That is very important. But today, we have another possibility. We have what is called endovascular therapy. It's not neurosurgery, but we are working together, neuroradiologists and neurosurgeons. That's the reason why I show you a few slides about that. Today, it's possible to embolize the malformation from inside, like if you do coronography, but you don't stop at the level of the heart. You go up into the carotid artery and in the arteries in the head, in the brain. And it's possible to arrive at the level of the aneurysm and to put coils inside that will, the calls will induce a clot, and due to the clot inside, no risk of bleeding anymore. S that's an example. This is the aneurysm before coiling, and this is the aneurysm. You don't see it anymore. Coils inside, but the dye and the blood is no more going inside is going normally in all the branches of the internal carotid artery. It's also possible today by endovascular therapy to treat such huge narrowing or stenosis of the carotid artery. By putting a stent, we know very well the stent from the heart, today it's possible to do stenting in the brain too. And again, from a puncture of the femoral artery and then going up. So this is the stent. And uh, it's nice to see 
the control the day after and one year after. In the past, it was impossible to treat such a lesion. And uh, today it's possible to navigate in the brain, in all the arteries that what do are doing neuroradiologists specialize in interventional neuroradiology. What few words about implants. We can put electrodes on the brain to relieve pain, to treat epilepsy, and of course to help neurosurgeons by stimulation in the eloquent area if either with uh, an awake patient or not. But we can also put deep electrodes in the brain, Parkinson's disease well known since many, many years, but also for obsessive compulsive disorder. Today it's possible to do that and we have a fantastic team at the KUL who is a leader in the world doing that type of treatment. This is the example of Parkinson's disease with the electrode in the subthalamic nucleus. We code it to a pacemaker and the tremor immediately stop. Another example with electrode on both sides, but what is maybe more important what is what you will see in this video. That has been given to me by my colleague and friend, Professor Philippe Koub from Montpellier in France. It's a child. You will see she has dystonia, a girl. You will see how she is moving with difficulties and the result after electrodes in the brain recorded to a pacemaker. This is a video. This is before surgery. Look how she walks. And her future is not nice. She is not far to become an adolescent. And see how she has to organize her life. After surgery with electrodes, some instability when she turns. Now look how she is walking. It's not a miracle, it's neurosurgery. So she may hope to have a normal life. Some words on fake news, because I have an ethics. I like to say a few words about that. A few years ago, that was the front page of the newspaper Le Soir in 2015. Greffen tête un cauchemar programmé, grafting a head, a program nightmare. A neurosurgeon from Italy was telling TV uh, newspaper not scientific, common newspaper, that he was ready to put a new head in a body or a new body to somebody who wanted to keep his head. And uh, he had a patient who was ready, of course. This poor man, he has normal head, very clever, but he has a wagnick of man disease and this is a neurosurgeon, and I can put the name because you can find this in the internet uh, without any problem, not uh, with my help. He was showing where he will cut. He was saying that he had a special blade. In several lectures I have said, I'm sure that he has been, I uh, would say, teach by terrorist Daesh in order to, to cut very well the head. So, putting a head on a body or a body on a head. 
And what is terrific is that he was saying that he was able to mend the transected spinal cord with polyethylene glycol. But if you know a little bit, I shall come to that slide later, if you know a little bit the anatomy, all the fibers, all the tract, it's impossible to put them. Today, we know very well that when even a teenager has a traffic accident, motorcycle accident, spine trauma, spinal cord trauma is paraplegic. We cannot operate, we cannot put uh, again to make the anatomy as it was before. But he says that with this PG, no problem, is doing that. If you know the microanatomy with the crossing fibers from one side to the other, motor tract, sensory tract, and so on, it's, it's a dream. Even to repair the anterior spinal artery, impossible. So he was explaining to public that this, you see, a banana, cut and spaghetti in order to explain to, I would say, large public what he was doing and repairing. That's why I speak of fake news and ethics. Something else, of course, impossible to do that in Europa with et our ethical committees. So he found a colleague in China, you have the name here, and the operation in 2015 in the Daily Mail, it was said that even the name of the hospital where they will perform in 2017 the surgery together. Fortunately, they did not. And the patient you have seen has changed his mind. He said, no, no, I keep my body. Something else, you need to find a body. And you can see in the news that the donor body could be taken from an executive prisoner. So we're ascetic in that. Can we accept that? Surely not. And if you transplant a human head, does the consciousness follow? It's, I think, people who think and who talk about that, it's really fake news. We have to, we have to know that because patients coming to the consultation, they ask uh, uh, me, Dr. Brocci, what do you think about? I have read, I have heard, I have seen on the TV. I am handicapped. There is a solution there. What do you think about? We have to be aware of that in order to answer correctly. So need of strict ethical guidelines, that is important. A few words on the future in order to end my talk. Robotics, of course, is very important today and will be increasing in the future. Uh, for example, robots today can perform microsuture, vascular microsuture, much better than what we can do with our hands. Of course, you know probably the existence of exoskeleton. It means it is something that which is put outside over the leg, linked to, a, uh, let's say, like a computer, and somebody who is paraplegic can stand up and walk with the exoskeleton. It's fantastic for the quality of life because we cannot repair the spinal cord. Today, something else is connection between the brain and machine what is called brain-machine interface. 
and uh, we can record the activity in the brain with an electrode and today over the brain, connected to, uh, uh, to detect the activity and uh, to be connected to a computer and by the mind, the patient can have a connection with the TV, can have a connection with the computer, can have some independence. It is a beginning, but it's not no more a dream. And recently, quadriplegic patients succeed to control by thought the cursor of a computer, or the mouse of the computer. So it's really, it's a we could, 10 years ago, we could not think that that could happen. To end my talk, grafting, we did it in the past for Parkinson's disease, but we stopped because the results were not lasting more than one year, so we decided to stop such an experiment. Though today, there is no brain grafting no more, only research in animals. But that is important. For example, this paper, very important from Professor van der Hagen from Brussels in Nature, he was, he succeeded to, to, to produce neuron, new neurons in the brain of the mouse. But of course, it is the beginning if we think that one day we could repair the brain. Something else is a possibility. This is uh, from Professor Goetz from Germany. And she can use the glia, which is, you see in the brain you have neurons, you have the glia, astrocytes, oligonadrocytes, and so on. And she is using astrocyte and modifying astrocyte into neurons. So maybe we could use our own cells for another aim in the future. But again, this is on mice. And last is something in the spinal cord of the monkey. So I did some grafting and look at the hand. Without the graft, it's difficult to take uh, the, uh, the foot and after the graft, look the fingers are able to, to take the, uh, the, the food correctly. So I think that the future is there. Combining with the computer, cell grafting, and we shall have a new way of neurosurgery in 10 or 20 years. Of course, we need strict ethical guidelines. Don't be afraid. Stay optimistic. Thank you very much.